who Dr. Roy Reed holds a master's degree in social work and a doctorate in clinical psychology with a dual emphasis in neuropsychology and uh, marriage and family therapy. He complete, completed his AP post, APA postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Psychiatry at UCLA and additional postdoctoral training in clinical research here at Harvard Medical School. He is currently an assistant professor of psychiatry and research psychologist in the department of psychiatry at UCLA. He mentors students, teaches, works with patients, and conducts research. He's also licensed in Nevada and works with patients in Las Vegas uh, seeking help for various addictive disorders, including uh, uh, behavioral addictions such as problem gambling and compulsive sexual behavior disorder. Dr. Reed has published numerous research articles on behavioral addictions in scientific journals and has worked uh, clinically with hundreds of individuals, couples, families that are negatively impacted by various addictions and other mental health issues. His works has, has been featured in uh, press outlets such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, as well as TV specials on ABC, CBS, and Fox News. He serves as the editorial board for several peer-reviewed journals and is trained and educated mental health professionals, industry specialists, government organizations, and lay audiences around the world. Without further ado, again, Dr. Reed, it's all yours, sir. Thank you, Robbie, and uh, for taking the time to host uh, these uh, webinars. I imagine they've been invaluable for people and uh, and um, great way to uh, get CEUs from home or your office and not having to travel through, at least in Los Angeles, to go through the whole uh, rigmarole of traffic can be an ordeal in of itself. So, you know, a few years ago, I was actually struck by the paucity or lack of uh, training or any kind of uh, uh, presentations at conferences on stress coping and problem gambling, despite the fact that it's a substantial issue for all of our patients. And I'm not really quite sure what the reason for that is. I think for a lot of people, it was like maybe this thought that it's too simplistic a topic or that you know, everybody knows stress coping 101. And yet, as I gone around and asked around and even in giving this presentation, uh, uh, I just gave this presentation on Friday at the Nevada uh, Council on Problem Gambling Conference. And so many people were like, wow, there's a lot of rich information in there that they weren't aware of. So uh, glad you're here today. And let's jump in and, and uh, talk a little about stress and, and how it applies to problem gambling. So this is just an overview of some of the things that we'll be talking about today. And again, uh, one of the things that uh, we have done and uh, since this presentation is we've actually developed a workbook for uh, problem gamblers. Uh, so if you uh, fire me off an email or maybe I'll just do it through Robbie uh, when this is all said and done, I'll send it to him and then once you complete your evaluations, he can send out a, a workbook that we've created. And the workbook has a lot of this content in it. So uh, first of all, there's two ways we kind of typically assess or measure stress in the research. One is kind of just this idea that various situations can cause stress for people. And uh, we try to uh, you know, stimulate or simulate those particular situations to induce stress, and then we measure it with all of our, you know, laboratory stuff and apparatus and whatnot. The problem is that what is stressful for you may not be stressful for me. And so that's not necessarily always the best way because we all, again, stress is often based on how we appraise the situation or perceive a situation. And something that I may find stressful, you may not find stressful. The second way is based on really uh, looking at physiological indices or measures of stress, galvanic skin response, cortisol, all of these sorts of things, heart rate, respirations. And the problem with that particular approach is that sometimes positive stress might show the same physiological responses as uh, something that we might consider a, a negative stressor. So for example, if I told you, you know, if you were getting married or just discovered that you had uh, gotten a large inheritance, 
uh, that that would be good news potentially, and um, we would hope, especially in the case of a, of a marriage, that it would be a good news, and yet that would potentially create the same physiological responses as learning that you just were diagnosed with chronic cancer, right? So uh, these are some of the challenges in measuring stress. But I think for the purposes of our work with patients, it really kind of comes down to what do they perceive as being uh, a situation or an experience that they feel they can't cope with, right? And whenever people have that perception that they cannot deal with a situation or they lack the resources, that is what we kind of characterize as stress for those patients. So in other words, it's really just this perceived inability to meet life's demands. And as we all know, we're always juggling uh, uh, and balancing all of these different things in our life, uh, getting the kids to school or getting the kids to their baseball game and work, and then our personal life and um, social interactions and, and all of the rest of that. It really does create uh, a lot of different demands. And even when we think we have everything in control, there's always those unexpected things that come up. And whenever we believe that like, we just don't have what it takes to address all of the demands that are being made, that is what we characterize as stress. In the wake of problem gambling, it's kind of interesting. There is this circularity. Uh, if you look at the DSM language, you know this idea that the gambling causes distress, but the distress itself leads to the gambling um, and, and causes gambling. So in other words, uh, stress is both a precipitating and a perpetuating risk factor for problem gambling. And this is what was kind of fascinating to me as I started to look at all of the agendas and the programs for all of these conferences and all of these trainings on gambling and nowhere, nowhere to be found was any presentation on stress. It just seemed like such a fundamental issue uh, that precipitated and perpetuates problem gambling, even based on the DSM-5 language, how on earth is it that we're not talking about this? And that was the uh, impetus for this particular presentation is like, we need to put something out there. So uh, a couple of the studies on stress, uh, this one uh, was interesting insofar as basically it suggests that stress leads to uh, inaccurate or poor processing of feedback, and that then leads to deficits in decision-making. So uh, this has implications for our working with our patients in a couple of different ways. Sometimes, uh, you know, people have important decisions to make uh, in the wake of uh, relationships uh, and other kinds of things related to perhaps consequences of problem gambling. And when people are stressed, uh, I think what I'll often tell patients is, let's get you to a healthier place and then let's have you make a decision about your marriage or let's have you make a decision about, you know, uh, pulling money out of your retirement or bankruptcy and all of the rest of that. Because when people are stressed, they're not gonna make, um, you know, make decisions from the best place. Um, this particular one, not surprising, uh, stress uh, increases gambling urges, which then contributes to gambling severity. That shouldn't be surprising. Some of these studies we have to smile about. It's almost like, did we need a study to tell us that? Um, uh, because our clinical acumen tells us that's true. Uh, almost obviously then the gambling severity is relevant because it also increases uh, these particular uh, uh, psychopathologies and in turn then causes like a somewhat like a uh, again that circularity where it feeds back into the loop causing more stress and more gambling severity. So question number one, uh, stress can either be a stimulus based or response based. So I think we give you a few minutes here to respond to this. Yeah, we're about 65%. Good job, everyone. Wow, Robbie, you gave them, you gave them easy questions. Man, I'm giving them softballs. <laughs> you guys should have this, right? I spoil them in the, 
right. in the workshops that we do. Somebody went to get a coffee in the kitchen and they <laughs> What do you give them? 60 Okay, T minus five seconds, guys. Okay, there you go. All right. Well, that's true, right? Um, so uh, this particular one was fascinating because <clears throat> what you would think is that problem gamblers are stressed out and they gamble. Um, and, and stress appears to be a generalized characteristic for problem gamblers. But what's fascinating about this particular study is that um, it would appear that chronic gambling desensitizes people to what would should be otherwise stressors uh, related to their, their problem gambling. And, um, uh, and so in other words, when people are engaged in, in, in gambling and they are problem gamblers, sometimes they take these huge risks, risks that we would sit there and say, whoa, you know, most of us on average would react to that from a place of, you know, oh my goodness, hell no, I, I'm not going to take this risk. Um, and part of our, our stress response cycle would alert us to the fact that like, hey, there's, this is a big threat. This is a big risk. This is a big danger. You don't want to do this. But because problem gamblers have desensitized themselves to that through chronic problem gambling and high risk taking behaviors, their HPA access isn't responding physiologically in the way that it should. And so they kind of matter of factly take these huge risks in the gambling problem gambling uh, activities that most of us, our HPA access and system would alert us to the fact that like this is, you know, this is not a good, good thing. So that's something to recognize. It, it does explain why sometimes problem gamblers can take huge risks and make really poor choices uh, because they have essentially uh, desensitized their stress response cycle in that regard. Uh, this particular study uh, just talks about like the, the personal relative deprivation theory. Again, that increases stress, problem gambling tendencies. Also, stress coping scale is a uh, one of the, the subscales on the gambling pathways questionnaire. These are some of the questions off of that. Uh, again, just kind of this study uh, found evidence for that. This was Alexander um, Blazinski and, and uh, Dr. Leonauer. Uh, again, the fact that this factor came up as, as significant in their, uh, their development of this scale, again, reaffirms that the stress-related uh, component of problem gambling is something that we should be looking at. So I'm going to transition here into terminology because I think how our patients describe what they're feeling and experiencing is important, but I also think it's important for them to have specificity around differentiating their experiences. Uh, and so these, I'm going to, you can just read them. I'm not going to read them for, verbatim, but I think it's important for patients to differentiate like when they're worried. Uh, uh, or if the worrying has gotten to the extent that it's excessive and interfering in their lives, then, okay, that's not just worrying. We're calling, we're, at that point, we label it anxiety. Um, or, uh, you know, if we think about, well, how does that differ from fear? Fear is more eminent danger or threat. Um, so, for example, I'm from Canada, and I'm driving down the road on an icy, snowy road, with black ice, and I am worried that I'm going to hit a patch of black ice, and then my car is going to spin out of control. I'm worrying, I'm worrying, I'm worrying, and now all of a sudden, I actually hit black ice, and my car actually starts to slide along the road. The moment my car starts to slide is when my worry transitions to fear. Does that make sense? So fear is when the danger or the whatever we're worrying about actually becomes a reality and, and it's an imminent threat. Um, and then stress is basically like, you know, whatever we're worrying about, um, it's this belief that like, you know, 
that's happening and I can't handle it. I'm not going to be able to deal with it. Something bad's going to happen. And whatever that bad thing is, I'm not going to be able to deal with it. So this is one way that I've articulated it in elsewhere in writing. Uh, all right, this is kind of weird. My research assistant put my name on this. So I'm going to read <laughs> here. I'm going to quote myself. It kind of sounds silly, but worry is having thoughts that something bad is going to happen. Anxiety is prolonged excessive worry that interferes with life or our ability to make meaningful changes. Fear arises in the moment our worry becomes a reality in a threatening way. And stress is the belief that we're not going to be able to deal with the bad things we've been worrying about, anxious about, or feeling afraid of. Right? And so when you're working with patients, I would just implore you to help them identify the differences between what they're worrying about, anxieties, fears, and stresses, and use the appropriate terminology and language in characterizing those internalized experiences, because there are different potential clinical implications for these different affective experiences. So if you think about stress more uh, broadly as it pertains to problem gambling, here is my argument for why we need to pay attention to this clinically with problem gamblers. Obviously, we've talked about the fact that it's correlated with urges and behavior. It's also correlated with higher rates of relapse. It's correlated and linked to impulsivity, which then also translates to problem gambling behavior. Stress is also a risk factor for suicide, which is also uh, correlated with problem gambling and higher uh, rates of suicide amongst problem gamblers compared to healthy control groups or other populations. Stress is linked to poor health outcomes, which are also common in problem gamblers. It's linked to substance abuse, uh, including smoking, vaping. It's linked to mental health. Uh, it's linked uh, and associated with lies and secrecy amongst problem gamblers. It's also associated with the financial difficulties and consequences of problem gambling. And it's associated with relationship conflict amongst problem gamblers. So, you know, I will often, and, and, and knowing about all of these, like, because one of the exercises we want to do and with problem gamblers is kind of help them identify the stressors that they're experiencing. And sometimes they're just like, well, they limit themselves to like, well, I don't have money to pay my bills. And I think it's important to help them recognize the vast array of associations of stress and the problem gambling or correlates of problem gambling so that they, when you're spending time working on it in therapy, they recognize the importance of this to all of the things that are going on in their lives. Uh, by the way, um, uh, feel free to, I, I've got the chat box on the left. I've got dual monitors here and I've got the chat box on the left side of my screen. So if any of you have questions or thoughts, you know, you know, that you want to just throw out there, i happy to entertain those as we go along. So the HPA access and the stress response, right? Uh, some of you are very uh, familiar with this. Others of you have, um, you know, it's been a while. And one of the things I like, and, and if you're not familiar with this or you have a difficult time explaining these concepts, um, I, uh, the two minute neuroscience video, here it is. And again, there's a link to this in the workbook that you can then provide to patients. And this is, this is it. This is your two minute lesson. Welcome on to two minute neuroscience, where I explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I'll discuss the HPA axis. The hypothalamic pituitary adrenal, or HPA, axis is best known for its role in our body's reaction to stress. The HPA the axis, axis includes a group of hormone-secreting glands from the nervous and endocrine systems, the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and adrenal glands. The hypothalamus is a small neuroendocrine structure situated just above the brainstem that controls the release of hormones from the pituitary gland a hormone-secreting gland that sits just below the hypothalamus. Someone says this sounds not too good. I'm the sorry. The pituitary gland can release hormones into the bloodstream to reach a variety of targets. In the case of the HPA axis, hormones released from the pituitary gland travel down to the kidneys and influence the secretion of hormones from endocrine glands called the adrenal glands, which sit on top of the kidneys. The primary function of the HPA axis is to regulate the stress response. 
When we experience something stressful, the hypothalamus releases a hormone called corticotropin-releasing hormone, or CRH. CRH signals the pituitary gland to secrete a hormone called adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, into the bloodstream. ACTH travels down to the adrenal glands, where it prompts the release of a hormone called cortisol from the cortex, or outer layer of the adrenal glands. The release of cortisol causes a number of changes that help the body to deal with stress. For example, it helps to mobilize energy like glucose, so the body has enough energy to cope with a prolonged stressor. When cortisol levels in the blood get high, this is sensed by receptors in areas of the brain like the hypothalamus and hippocampus, which leads to the shutting off of the stress response through what is known as a negative feedback mechanism. All right. So that's kind of your 101 uh, kind of a, 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 a lecture on the HPA axis. But essentially, you know, if people have prolonged stress, that um, the uh, the immune system is compromised because cortisol levels are depleted in the system. And that's why you're more susceptible to getting sick if you're uh, chronically stressed and all of the rest of that, that, that it creates that. Let me, um, let me do this. I'm gonna just put in the chat box. There is the link to that video in the chat box so that if you wanna just look at that on your own, you can uh, Welcome. Uh, find that. So let's talk about a uh, stress coping model because I think this is critical to kind of intervening with patients uh, around stress coping. So essentially we talked about the idea that, um, you know, uh, that, that stress is this perception that I don't have what it takes to meet the demands in my life. Well, that's obviously an appraisal, right? It's a subjective perspective that says, I don't have enough. And so, you know, often if that's the case, um, you know, it can lead to negative appraisals, but there's also positive appraisals and that then becomes an adaptive coping strategy, which actually healthy stress coping is a resource or the absence of it is a demand. I mean, have you ever thought about that? That in fact, if I don't cope with stress well, that's actually an additional demand in the system of you know, resources and demands. Well, obviously in this model, you've got as a therapist, you can either increase resources or decrease demands. And sometimes we gotta get pretty creative about this, but the place that I start is I actually have them list. What resources do they have? What demands do they have? So for example, you know, I first of all kind of define the demands I defined resources, and these are the ways that we do that. Um, and here shortly, I'll uh, give you some examples of, of these. Um, actually, before we do that poll, uh, you know, again, the idea here is to help them think outside the box. And in the workbook that I'm going to send Robbie to, to email to all of you, uh, that workbook has some of these examples, but a sheet where they can kind of say, what are their resources? What are their demands? So for example, resources can be even the ability to be assertive or having knowledge or time. Uh, time's an interesting one because once that's expended, you can't ever get that back. Um, adequate physical health, effective communication skills, just even the ability to think outside the box and problem solve can be. Optimism, have you ever thought about optimism as like an asset or a resource? In fact, there was a study about this a while back where um, and this was approved by the IRB, believe it or not, uh, where uh, we took people that were healthy control subjects who were, um, you know, across the board, but one of the groups was optimistic and the other group was pessimistic. And we injected them with the flu virus. Now, you, most of you know that just because you're exposed to the flu doesn't mean you'll actually contract the flu. And so we were curious to see which ones would develop the flu and which ones weren't. And uh, some of you are like, are you kidding me? Well, they all got paid $800 to participate in this. But uh, essentially, uh, very few people in the optimistic group, it was less than 20%, uh, less than 20% in the optimistic group uh, developed the flu, uh, whereas those in the more pessimistic group, a substantial number of those individuals developed the flu. 
Um, and, and of course, we laugh because maybe we we're saying, yeah, uh, in the beginning of the study, they were pessimistic and they were like, yeah, I know I'm going to be one of these guys that develops the flu. And lo and behold, they did. But the point is, is that optimism itself appears to be a protective, protective factor in, um, uh, you know, in, in the wake of um, uh, various situations in life and has out implications for health. Thinking outside the box, having supportive friends or optimal emotional health. Um, I even talk about perseverance. I mean, have you ever thought about that? We have these patients that come to us and you know, they've had multiple unsuccessful attempts to try to abandon their uh, gambling behaviors and yet they keep coming. Like, I think it's important that we highlight that for our patients, that we bring it to their attention. Like you are, you know, you continue to try and it's so much better to try and fail and try and fail than to try and fail and fail to try again, right? Like highlight for them, you are persevering. Here you are in my office and you are continuing to try. Have you ever considered this is a great resource, a great strength of yours? Conversely, um, we have these demands. Um, you know, for example, rumination might be a demand, difficulties coping with uncomfortable emotions or the inability to prioritize or difficulties focusing, concentrating. Uh, these can all be demands. Uh, not having enough money, that can be demands as well. Okay, uh, here we go. Poll number two, Ravi. Um, so I'm here. Here you go. All right. Do you have any of these questions? Robbie is the one that wrote. <laughs> You're deferred. And this is another softball, maybe a step up. And uh, I liked how you separated these four, by the way, Dr. Reed. Oh, thank you. I wonder if you can, are all four possible? All right. I'm going to take, I'm gonna take 30, I'm, I'm gonna take 30 seconds and go refill my water. Okay, no worries. Okay, guys, according to our earlier discussion, fear is what? Is it A, a primary emotion? Is it B, a psychological response to imminent danger? Is it C, both A and B, or is it D, none of the above? According to our earlier discussion, fear is A, a primary emotion, B, psychological response to imminent danger, C, both A and B, or D, none of the above? Okay, did everybody answer it for you, Robbie? Yep. Good job, okay. guys. Both A and B. There we go. There we go. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, as you work with problem gamblers, again, try to help them think outside the box and identifying their resources and demands. I try to remind them, like, you know, don't let them just fixate on the financial component of, of resources or demands. And again, I, I remind them, like, problem gambling isn't about money any more than an eating disorder is about food or sex addictions about sex and so forth. So help them uh, think outside the box in, in terms of that. So again, this is kind of just an example. And again, uh, you're gonna, they're recording this. So presumably you'll have access to, to look at this, but uh, at a later point. But again, these are just examples of resources and demands. And I try to help the patients, uh, you know, uh, identify these in terms of their own, their own uh, lives. And then with the idea that like, what, where can we increase resources? Where can we decrease demands? And sometimes this can be like, this can, I had, for example, one patient who lived in Beverly Hills and they were uh, struggling and, and really they weren't exercising or taking care of themselves. By the way, exercise is an, an interesting one because um, it's, it's a demand in the one sense, but overall it's a resource, right? Because even though it takes time, it takes energy and effort, um, uh, you know, the, the, the bottom line is that in the end, uh, the, the, it provides, you know, more efficient uh, distribution of nutrients in your system. You feel better about yourself. You have more energy. So overall, but anyway, this particular patient, she was saying, well, 
you know, I, I, I've got, I, you know, I end up having to go to the grocery store once or twice a week. And by the time everything is done, it's like, I don't have time to go exercise. And I said, well, what if I can get you, what if I can get you four hours a week back? I said, would you commit to exercise? And then she was kind of almost challenging, like, all right, Dr. Reed, sure. You know, if you're going to, you know, magically give me four hours a week. Well, I actually knew the grocery store in Beverly Hills where she shopped. And what was great about that grocery store is they have uh, a delivery service and it's for 1%. So if you spend $100 or $200, it's it's 2% of your bill, 1% of your bill, it's like, you know, whatever, it's a dollar or two to have it delivered. And of course, you know, people, it's Beverly Hills. So, you know, how can they afford to do that? Well, people do that because they get nice tips in Beverly Hills. So, you know, I think that's kind of how they made that work. But um, so we set it up all on the internet where she could order the food. It was a two hour window where they would just deliver it. Um, And then every week she could just go in and tweak her order for any additional things that she needed beyond the staple products. And now she didn't have to drive through traffic, go to the store. Because most of you know, in LA, three mile drive is like a 30 minute car ride, right? Like y'all know that. It's terrible in LA. <clears throat> but um, she saved an hour in traffic, an hour at the grocery store, all the time unpacking. I got her her four hours. So she kind of like, you know, <laughs> she's like, damn it, he did it. Uh, yeah, so we pulled it off. We got her those hours and now she could commit. In fact, she, what she said after the fact, she said, actually, I'm saving more money because when I go through the website, I see products like I want to look at, uh, like, let's say I want to buy, you know, whatever bread. It's like, wow, there's some bread here that's really healthy that I never saw when I went to the store and it's cheaper. She actually would save more money uh, in that regard. But the more important thing for her was saving the time, right? I saved her the time. And so now I increased this resource called time and she was able to exercise now, right? And get healthier and all the rest of that, feel better about herself. And then she was less likely to go gamble when she felt good about herself. But this, and I'm not trying to say this to blow my own horn or to, to brag. What I'm trying to give you is just examples of how as clinicians, we've got to think outside the box in helping our patients decrease their demands and increase their resources, right? So sometimes it's just these small little things. It's these thousand small moments where we can help them do that that can make the difference, right? Um, and, and so forth. So uh, that's something. In it. Now, this is kind of a model I've come up with where uh, positive stressors, negative stressors. And then, uh, so this is how you kind of break down. So after people identify their resources, their demands, then we kind of talk about stressors in their lives and uh, help them understand how to classify their stressors. So positive stressors are anything above the horizontal line is a positive and below it is a negative stressor. But then we further break it out to whether or not they have control over the stress or they're powerless about the stressor. And um, you know, so for example, let's say I receive an inheritance. I didn't predict that. I didn't have control over that. Well, so I'm powerless about that stressor and it's a positive stressor. I'm getting married. Well, that's something I have control over. It's also a positive stressor. Or gambling losses. I do have control over whether or not I lose money gambling by just whether or not I go gamble. And that's a negative stressor. Or for example, terminal cancer, that's something I'm powerless over. I mean, you are just mostly, right? Like, I mean, you could, you know, people could say, well, you chose to smoke, blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, so I'm powerless for the most part and it's a negative stressor, right? And then you've got this element of time. Is it short or is it longer in terms of the, the duration, right? So for example, if my students at UCLA have a uh, um, midterm exam, like that's short term. And it's also a stress over which they have control. They can study and then they won't be so stressed out. And it's generally a positive stressor. In fact, because if you think about it, uh, the college days in life is one of the few times in our lives 
when we pay to be stressed. We call it tuition, right? Uh, so and generally it's with this idea that I'm gonna use. So this is kind of my model of how I get people to think about stress in their lives. So just, uh, and, and you know, you may, in the workbook, in the workbook, um, and again, Robbie, I, I should have sent that to you. I'll send it to you after this. Um, but it wasn't really something I was going to do initially, but I'm going to give you this workbook free. It's yours. I, I developed it uh, using money from UCLA and Nevada grants, and those are taxpayer dollars. So you get us for free. Um, you can use it with patients, but it actually goes through and it helps them identify these quadrants of positive versus negative stressors. There's also the stress proneness scale, which again is positively correlated with problem gambling uh, via the nods uh, and so forth. I also invite people to think about their coping strategies. And this is why one of the reasons why they come to therapy from the coping strategies inventory. And not surprisingly, when I run data on this, more problem gamblers tend to engage and recruit more avoidant strategies in their problem gambling behaviors, right? So not surprising. So our goal is to then help them cultivate and develop assert assertive strategies and proactivity, we'll talk about that shortly, like what that might look like in terms of their. So coping strategies. First of all, let's talk about psychoeducation. Um, I help patients break down the things they're worried about or stressed about into, and I say that worried or stressed, and sometimes it's both, um, you know, something that's hypothetical versus uh, uh, practical. So a hypothetical worry might be, you know, oh, I'm, I'm worried I'm going to develop some chronic illness. Do you have any history of chronic illness or family history? No, I just think I'm going to, you know, wait, that's a hypothetical worry. We, we teach patients to let that go versus a practical worry is, oh, I'm really anxious and worried that um, I haven't been making my car payments because I've gambled all my money away. And I'm really worried that the, um, that the bank is going to come and repossess my car. And so I'm anxious and, and, and about that happening. I, that's all I can think about, et cetera. So practical worries are something we tackle. So I might encourage them, well, let's be proactive about this. Let's call the bank. Let's try to renegotiate the payments. Let's figure something out here. Because believe it or not, that bank does not want to repossess that car. Um, so helping them kind of focus on practical, the practical worries and coming up with problem solving to deal with those. Um, helping, uh, this next one is helping clients uh, positively reframe their stressors. Remember, many stressors are about the perception rather than the actual reality. So, you know, during COVID, we've had some patients that have lost jobs, which added to their stressors. And yet when we talked about that, it's like, well, you know, you really weren't happy in that career. And, you know, one way to look at this is, you know, you now have the opportunity to pursue some of the things that you've always wanted to pursue. And, uh, and, and that's going to give you a whole different career change that you could probably be more happy with. So again, helping people kind of figure out ways to positively uh, reframe uh, their situations can help reduce worry, stress, anxiety, and so forth. Helping uh, patients, um, you know, with the common interventions for financial challenges, you know, such as having someone else manage money. I use the true financial link, uh, especially with my patients in Las Vegas. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the true financial link, but basically it's a prepaid card that somebody else, whoever their accountability partner is, can actually go in there and they can uh, create administrative controls so that it locks down the card. You can only spend it at these grocery stores. Uh, you can't get cash back at the grocery. You can't get cash back at the gas station. In fact, when you go to the gas station, you can only use it at the pump. You can't use it inside at the Chevron because in Las Vegas, you know, the gas station, 7-Eleven, grocery store, gambling everywhere. So it really locks that down. Um, and again, so these are practical solutions to come up with for financial interventions, um, setting up a budget, the GA pressure relief meetings and so forth. Uh, lots of things there that you can do as well. Uh, helping identify the sources of the stress. And again, 
Sometimes stress is a function of just unrealistic goals or expectations. Well, recalibrating those expectations about uh, the things they want to achieve can be advantageous. So, the, you know, thinking about all these various stress coping strategies, um, and there's a whole bunch of others that I'll talk about shortly, but those are just some examples. I also have them uh, listen to this TED Talk, The Upside of Stress. And again, in the workbook, it's a PDF workbook, um, and there's hyperlinks to all of these things. So, um, so this uh, Dr. Kelly McGonigal does a really nice job of reframing stress. Again, sometimes it's about the perception, right? Okay, uh, your third question here. <laughs> yes, third and final. Which of the following is an example of an avoidant strategy? Is it A, motivational interviewing? Is it B, humor? Is it C, alcohol abuse? D, none of the above. Which of the following is an example of an avoidant strategy? Is it A, motivational interviewing? Is it B, humor? Is it C, alcohol abuse? Is it D, none of the above? Another softball, guys. Very good, we're almost over 90%. Thank you. It was B, humor. There we go. Right. Thank you, everybody. And, and, and just, uh, uh, again, you can blame Robbie for these questions. But um, uh, alcohol abuse potentially could be avoidant, an avoidant strategy. But based on the content of what we've been talking about, based on the coping strategies uh, inventory, Alcohol abuse is not one of the domains that's measured uh, uh, within that, whereas humor is used to kind of avoid talking about the things that might be more salient for them. Yeah. And right. Just so you guys know, it's just for attendance <laughs> policy. Oh, there, measure, you so. there you go. There you go. And no, this is not your licensure exam. Um, exactly. Okay. Uh, if stress arises from poor time management, help the client with poor, poor time management. For example, sometimes poor time management is a function of adult ADHD, which is common in 25 to 28% of our patients. Uh, maybe it's because they're people pleasers and they just have difficulty saying no. So I love that book, Disease to Please, right? It help, helps people say no. Um, so again, think about the relationship between poor time management and stress, right? Over committing yourself, you're gonna feel stressed. Um, helping them focus on things they can control. Uh, uh, and then obviously some of the things like listening to music, yoga, healthy distractions, spirituality, developing a hobby, more balanced lifestyle. Those are all things. If psychopathology is involved, consider referrals for medications for depression, adult ADHD, to kind of help attenuate the symptoms of the disorder. Again, these are just ways to help with the correlates of stress uh, and stress responding. Um, this particular TED talk is a good one. Everything you think you know about addiction is wrong. And he kind of talks about developing connections or reconnecting with others and uh, who are supportive of your life goals. But in other words, those connections and the social support system uh, and cultivating that is the antithesis of addiction, but it's also uh, helpful in reducing stress because one of the most difficult things about people experiencing stress is feeling it alone or feeling that they are alone in their experience of stress. And we've, we've um, even uh, looked at this in MRI studies, right, where someone's given a small little um, pain uh, stimuli and those that would have their romantic partners there in the, in the room holding hand their hand versus those that wouldn't, we saw a lot more cortical activation in that stressor uh, of regions of the brain associated with pain and emotional arousal uh, was substantially more significant in people who were alone during the MRI scan 
versus people who uh, had the romantic partner there holding their hand. And it wasn't that the romantic partner was alleviating the, the, the suffering, but it was this idea that they weren't alone in that moment of stress and, and, and suffering. So that's really important to help them cultivate um, a social support network. I also love the Wheel of Life Balance. You can Google this if you want. But again, it's helping patients cultivate that balance. You know, they'll on each one of these domains, they'll rate it out of five out of 10, how well they're doing. And then you can easily see like, okay, finances is out of balance, family and friends, romance. You know, you can see the areas quickly that are out of balance and helping them cultivate goals, treatment goals that will help restore balance. Again, so much of addiction is about imbalance and the loss of perspective about what's important and maintaining that imbalance and the balance. So uh, this is just a real nice little tool um, that you can utilize to help you with that. And you can just Google that. There's lots of sheets out there, YouTube videos out there that will kind of educate you on how to do this with a client. It really, it, it's not that hard to do at all. Sometimes patients will just need help with basic relaxation techniques, uh, learning how proper breathing exercises. Now, um, and, and so again, there's biofeedback, there's all of these different sources. And in the workbook that I'm going to give you guys, um, you know, there's these uh, various things here that uh, additional websites um, I talk about the stress eraser. Now, let me show you the stress eraser. It comes in a nice little thing like this. I bought mine refurbished for $99, okay? And this is all you do. You basically turn it on. Let me see if this one's got batteries. I don't know if this has got batteries or not. Um, it doesn't. But essentially, a patient will just put their finger in there, okay? And then you'll start to see the lines, because it's reading off the index. And, the, and then you teach them, you know, breathe five seconds in slowly, five seconds out slowly. You're just gonna basically teach them uh, how to breathe properly. And when they breathe properly, this particular wave pattern you see on the screen, where they're getting three, uh, three squares, that is excellent breathing based on their pulse rate waves. So in other words, that, once they start breathing like that, their graph will look like this. So it's biofeedback. And really, um, you know, you can essentially do this, right, with a patient. So I'll actually have them do it in the office for like maybe two, three sessions in a row. For the first five minutes, I'll have them breathe and show me that they're actually able to, because we often say, well, take a deep breath. No, 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 no. Don't take a deep breath. Like breathe five seconds in, five seconds out, you know, or something thereabouts. Um, do that for about three minutes straight and you will completely subdue your parasympathetic nervous system. And by the way, it is physiologically impossible to be breathing at this rate and simultaneously have a panic attack. It is physiologically impossible. You can't. So breathing is, is really uh, an important thing. And in fact, I just have a book here uh, uh, that I got recently called Breathe by James Nestor. And it's a fascinating book on breathing um, that, that I would highly recommend uh, for you. It is called The Stress Eraser. Um, and again, they're difficult to track down now. Um, so I, again, I bought, I bought mine off eBay for $99. It was refurbished. So, um, you know, I'll let you guys figure out to try to get one of those. Um, obviously, stress coping related to just the basic 101 stuff, eat, move, sleep. Um, you know, even things like hydration, right? Like I, I all day long, I, I go through water like nothing else, um, you know, and that's important to stay hydrated. By the way, we tell people drink lots and lots and lots of water, okay? You do not want a patient drinking more than two cups of water at one time. So make sure that when you say drink lots of water at one in one sitting, like in one moment, do not drink more than two cups of water. That's actually contraindicated. So, you know, drink a, you know, just the idea is just drink steadily throughout the day. 
um, sleep, and sometimes you have to educate patients on sleep hygiene, right? Eating healthy. Now, a couple of years ago, I did some uh, research on eating because I had to do a presentation on nutrition and problem gambling. Much to my dismay, because I love steaks and all of the rest of that, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to go on record as a UCLA research psychologist. I'm trained at Harvard to do clinical research, to investigate, to do literature reviews accurately and properly. The most empirically supported health lifestyle for nutrition right now is a whole food plant-based diet. It's, there's, the evidence is so overwhelming for this. And trust me, when I discovered that, like it broke my heart because I was like, crap, I love me. And oh my God, cheese, like give up cheese. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that everybody has to be perfect, but if you're making recommendations, uh, whole food plant-based diet is absolutely hands down. And while there is research on keto diets, I'm going to tell you, most of that stuff is published in lower tier journals and keto diets are not a healthy uh, uh, diet for long-term sustainability, right? Um, and again, I've tried keto diets in the past and all the rest of that. I'm not saying that I haven't experimented with some of this stuff. And the keto diets are kind of uh, tempting because you do lose quite a lot of weight uh, and all the rest of that. But the most empirically supported health lifestyle is a whole food plant-based diet. And there's a website, I'll put it in here. It's new nutritionfacts.org. Uh, and that's Dr. McGregor. It's an amazing website. I highly recommend it to you. Uh, helping people get physically active. And again, the thing I love about the, the, um, this particular app, uh, and there's the link for it that you can get from the website, is that it, it gives you uh, kudos for like gardening, home repairs. It's not just focused on exercise. Mindfulness, uh, again, I don't need to go through this at nauseum. Uh, most of us are aware, well aware of, of the whole mindfulness movement. And let me give you this. Uh, I actually created an entire hour long YouTube video talking about uh, mindfulness and exercise uh, on dealing with problem gambling. gambling. You can understand. And this is a video that I've really created for uh, problem gamblers. I mean, don't get me wrong. If you watch it, you will get a lot out of it. So I, I made the presentation so that this is a link you could just send to your patients and I'm putting it in the chat box now. Um, and it's a, an hour long video that you could give as a homework assignment to your patients to kind of get them educated about mindfulness and the specific ways mindfulness can be helpful. Uh, and again, these links are, are in the uh, thing. Lots of studies to support mindfulness, including one that we did Gratitude practices, again, there's also an entire video on gratitude. It's a 10 minute video on gratitude. I'm gonna create the link here in the box uh, that I did that you can go to and watch as well. Bibliotherapy, um, and we're about to wrap up here for time, but uh, lots of great books out there. My rule of thumb is, and, and I, I suspect most of you are um, keen on this, don't ever recommend a book that you haven't read. Uh, but these are all books that I actually have read, uh, I've gotten into, and I think I would recommend any of these. Um, but I often just have patients go out to Amazon, read the reviews, read the, what the book's about, and see what might resonate with them. So that is, uh, by summary, you know, uh, these are the points that I would make. Um, uh, lots of different interventions to help people cope with stress. And, uh, and uh, hopefully you'll uh, you know, be able to recognize that as an important component. And this is the Stress Coping Strategies Workbook, okay? So, um, Robbie, can, if I email this book to you, will you email it out to everybody? Sure, we can get it out to everyone. Okay, great. Uh, and then that's my contact information. If anybody wants to contact me directly, they can just email me, roryreed at ucla.edu. So, we've got two minutes for questions. Yeah, Robbie? <laughs> Any questions for Dr. Rory Reed as we settle in on our last couple of minutes? 
questions regarding stress, coping with stress. Wow, this is great. Okay. You're getting a couple of thank yous. Okay, all right. Thank you, Claudia. Good to see you, Teresa. And thank you for everybody being on the line today. It looks like uh, there's not a lot of, there's not any questions, but a lot of thank yous. And thank you, Dr. Rory Reed for sharing this uh, great helpful information. Hopefully it'll help folks in Illinois uh, in their agencies and, and in their practices. So again, we want to thank Dr. Rory Reed today for his talk on helping problem gamblers cope with stress and worry. Thanks guys and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. All right. Thanks All for right. having me and, uh, and uh, good luck. And again, uh, go ahead and, and I'm, I just emailed that uh, workbook to you, Robbie, so you can get it out sure. to everybody. We'll get it out to everybody with your certificates. <laughs> Thank for those you. of you who answered the questions, right? Yeah. Okay. Can, you also right. Give, can you also give me CEUs for this as well, Robbie? Yeah, absolutely. I'll send you the Thank link you. when we get it. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.